Tonight, inside the trail of threats, police in Ontario lay multiple charges in attempted extortions. Parallel investigations across Canada. You've been wearing a bulletproof vest. Yes, sir. Are you wearing one right now? Yes, sir. The terror of being a target. I saw five go down. Overdose crisis. A small Ontario city, a sudden surge, and a tainted drug supply. Revving up the fight against rising car theft. Ottawa's multi-million dollar commitment. Plus, reinforcements in the Maritimes. The cadets digging out those snowed in. Oh, appreciative. Very appreciative. And a financial face-off over taxes. Scores! John Tavares! The legal power play as Leafs captain John Tavares goes to court. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We are hearing tonight from the victim of several alleged extortion attempts and the extraordinary steps he is taking to protect his life. Police in Ontario today said the incidents were part of a disturbing nationwide trend with perpetrators demanding payment and failing that threatening violent punishment. CTV's Adrian Gobriel leads us off. With a pistol in each hand, a gunman sends a barrage of bullets slicing through a Brampton, Ontario home. As waves of gun violence across Canada pierce any sense of safety for many in the South Asian community. There are similar trends that we've been seeing uh, in Alberta and as well as lower mainland British Columbia, as well as in certain locations in the U.S. For several weeks, CTV News has been investigating extortion attempts on South Asian businesses across the country. West of Toronto, police announced the arrest of five suspects, including these three individuals, who police say are involved in just some of the 29 reported extortion attempts in Peel region. Members of the community tell us they've received messages demanding they each hand over $1 million. When they decline, bullets begin to fly. This is one of multiple homes in Brampton that has been hit. Take a look at this garage door. There's four bullet holes. There's another one inside the front door. Area residents say they're desperate for the authorities and all levels of government to intervene. Their concern will go from counting bullets to funerals. Could you ever imagine this happening to you here in Canada? Never. Never. We spoke with this business owner who's been targeted multiple times. We've agreed to protect his identity. What lengths have you been going to to keep yourself and your family safe? We are putting the, the bulletproof jackets. You've been wearing a bulletproof vest? Yes. Sir. Are you wearing one right now? Yes, I do. Can we see it? Yes. Sir. For my peace of mind and uh, my family, I, I have to give some measures for my safety. The violent videos are being recorded and shared on social media pages linked to known gangsters in India. Essentially, you're spreading ter terror across our city, across the country. And when that influence is coming from outside of Canada, that adds actually a concern. Police here in Peel region tell us they're working with the RCMP and have reached out to authorities in India. But tonight, that's of little comfort to the South Asian community in neighborhoods like this one. Omar. A definite sense of unease. All right, Adrian, thank you. There is also new urgency to a nationwide crisis prompting a special warning in an Ontario city of about 55,000 people. Belleville police caution the public to avoid unnecessary travel downtown after more than a dozen people overdosed in less than an hour. CTV's Heather Wright on the spike and the warnings to other cities. The calls began coming in at around 2.30 Tuesday afternoon. People overdosing after consuming drugs in downtown Belleville. But I saw five go down like boom, 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 boom. Steve says he was just arriving to the Bridge Street United Church, which offers drop-in services for the city's homeless, when he saw people collapsing on the ground. Between when they did hail and between when they down, went down, I put a high end on five minutes. Two hours later, police sent out an alert that they were responding to 13 overdoses, asking people to avoid the downtown core. By the next morning, the number was up to 17, none of them fatal. The city's mayor says they need more help, asking the province and Ottawa 
for additional funding. We can't afford to, to fix it ourselves. Uh, we, you know, uh, the best case is uh, housing first and wraparound services. It's not going to cure every, everybody, but that's kind of the gold standard to get there. It's, it's devastating. Todd Buchanan works with people struggling with addiction and says there needs to be a new approach to tackle this crisis. It comes from community services, it comes from policing, it comes from the government's willingness to look outside the box and try and find solutions that, that may seem on the surface to be perhaps controversial. Officials in cities and towns right across the country say they are seeing a drug supply becoming increasingly more toxic. Ottawa Public Health says there were 22 suspected overdose deaths in January alone. Contributing to that increase, xylazine, a tranquilizer used for elephants, making its way into the drug supply. When people are bringing their samples of fentanyl in to be tested, it's almost found in one of every second or third sample as of the last 10 days or so. And while naloxone is effective in reversing overdoses, it doesn't work when drugs are laced with tranquilizers. Like As for people like Steve, he feels little is being done. Not enough, not even touching it. A call for help from one city, struggling with a problem many others are facing. Heather Wright, CTV News, Belleville, Ontario. A former senior RCMP intelligence official convicted of leaking classified information was sentenced to 14 years today in a historic case. And CTV's Judy Trin has been following it from the start. Judy, what sets this one apart? Omar, this is the first time Canada's Security of Information Act was tested in a trial. The judge expected legal challenges in this case, and that's exactly what happened. Cameron Ordis was found guilty of passing top secret information about police operations to suspects linked to global crime organizations, such as drug cartels and terrorist groups. The Crown wants prison time twice as long as the 14 years Ordis got and is appealing the judge's sentence. Mr. Cameron Ordis betrayed the RCMP. He betrayed our domestic intelligence partners. He betrayed the Five Eyes community. The Crown portrayed Ordis as a rogue operator, but Ordis testified he was working with a foreign agency to lure criminals to use an encrypted network so they could be monitored. The defense is appealing his conviction. I strongly feel that had the jury been able to hear my client's entire defense in its entirety, that they might have come to a different conclusion. Ordis's lawyer says national security concerns prevented him from telling jurors the name of that foreign agency and other information. As Ordis waits for his appeal hearing, he will seek bail. And Omar, that's a move the Crown will oppose. All right, Judy, thank you. Every hour in this country, thieves steal a dozen cars. The speed of that surge has resulted in more than a billion dollars in insurance claims. And now, on the eve of a national summit, there are new supports to pump the brakes on the crisis. Here's CTV's Vanessa Lee. Dramatic footage from a used car dealership north of Montreal shows the moment a couple posing as buyers steals the vehicle. They rip through the parking lot, almost hitting the salesperson. Police have made no arrests, and there is no sign of the Mercedes, likely en route overseas. Today, Ottawa announced $28 million in new money to help border agents stop the exporting of stolen vehicles. The agency will explore new detection technology solutions and the use of advanced analytical tools such as artificial intelligence. There is an urgency to find concrete solutions. According to a new study, a vehicle is now stolen every five minutes. Eric Nolan was having dinner in a Montreal suburb Monday night when his 2023 Toyota Tacoma disappeared from in front of the restaurant. As I called the police immediately, they said, you know, we recover maybe one in 25 vehicles. So, you know, the chances of me getting my vehicle back anytime soon or at all are slim to none. The federal government says an estimated 90,000 cars are stolen every year, costing insurance policyholders and taxpayers about a billion dollars. This is the cash cow of organized crime. What's happening is you have a really concerted effort by, by criminal gangs internationally to take advantage of Canada. A family in Hamilton, Ontario is traumatized after men with guns burst into their home last weekend and took two luxury cars. Police have since recovered one of the vehicles. 
Tomorrow, politicians will be meeting with industry executives, police forces and members of the Canada Border Services Agency, with many saying action is needed, not talk. Omar. All right, Vanessa, thank you. Canadian Coast Guard cadets are now helping with a massive cleanup in Nova Scotia after a historic storm. The province says more than a thousand people are working around the clock to clear the snow. But as CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Najgate reports, the battle to clear it is not over. No matter where you go in Nova Scotia, there are still so many in need of help. It's insane. I've never seen snow like this. Another day digging out, another family trying to make the best of it. It's been a three-day process so far. <laughs> it's hard. It's heavy. Bill McDonald has been plowing steady since Monday. Requests keep pouring in. All kinds. All kinds. I can't keep up with them now. More than 600 people from across the province have called the 311 helpline, unable to clear the snow themselves. Well, we're locked in, that's for sure, but trying to stay positive. This bus full of Canadian Coast Guard College cadets answered that call today going from house to house to clear a path and make sure residents can get what they need. We're at least here to make sure everyone's got their food and medication and or at least do what we can to make sure that they get that necessities. People in rural northern Nova Scotia have also spent days stranded. If you know you can't reach the road or outside help, it eats at you. Back in Cape Breton, the chief for Eskasoni First Nation says their local state of emergency has been lifted with 80% of their roads cleared. Concerns were high on the weekend, with the elderly not able to get to their dialysis appointments. Yes, yeah, a vulnerable community. We had issues to try to get to the patients, uh, EHS, assistant EHS, try to get to them, and uh, it was very challenging. Tonight, the Cape Breton SPCA had to evacuate all 45 of its animals from its building as heavy snow and ice became too much for the roof. The beams are bowing and uh, it's just looking a little, a little too scary for us. So we have somebody safely coming tomorrow to clear the roof and then we need to get a structural engineer in here as soon as possible. As the cleanup drags on and more help is still desperately needed for Nova Scotia, more structural headaches like this will likely emerge in the coming days. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. The federal conservative leader today confirmed he is against transgender minors using puberty blockers, siding with Alberta's premier who has unveiled a series of controversial restrictions. Pierre Polyev's comments prompted backlash from the prime minister and deepened what is already a major divide. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. Students in Alberta walked out of class to denounce Premier Daniel Smith's controversial gender policies. I don't think she understands how she's affecting these kids, how she's affecting their mental health. Nearly a week after Smith put them forward, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev took a position on one of them. I think we should protect the rights of parents to make their own decisions with regards to their children. And I believe that adults should have the freedom to make any decision they want about their bodies. You are against puberty blockers for kids under the age of 18. Yes. That would actually go further than Alberta's proposal to ban puberty blockers for those 15 and younger. What Mr. Polyev and Ms. Smith are proposing is to take away uh, the rights of parents and their kids to make the right choices for them with their doctors. Pediatricians say puberty blockers reduce the risk of depression and suicide associated with gender dysphoria. It allows youth and adolescents to um, make a decision over a longer period of time rather than being pressured by the pubertal changes that naturally occur at a certain age. Mitchell Plunkett grew up in Alberta and now worries about other trans youth who could be denied treatment. Having access to puberty blockers quite literally saved my life. Um, if I had continued having female puberty, I would not be here standing today because it made me suicidal. Though there was support for Smith's policies at this small counter protest in Alberta. A 13 year old should not, does not have the ability to make those decisions. This divisive debate will continue as the Alberta government prepares to table its legislation in the fall. Omar. All right, Kevin, thank you. And for the first time since members of his family disclosed their medical challenges, the heir to the British throne addressed the outpouring of support today. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you also 
for the kind messages of support for Catherine and for my father. It's fair to say the past few weeks have had a rather medical focus. So I thought I'd come to an air ambulance function to get away from it all. Prince William joined Tom Cruise at a charity gala taking center stage for the Royals after the King was sidelined by his cancer diagnosis. The Prince of Wales had postponed public duties last month to help his wife recover from an abdominal surgery. Coming up, the diplomatic balancing act in the Middle East. We do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. The U.S. push as Israel rejects Hamas's ceasefire terms. Plus, when roads become rinks, taking advantage of winter's icing. Four months into the Israel-Hamas war, there are no signs tonight of the conflict coming to an end anytime soon. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected Hamas's terms for a ceasefire and hostage release agreement shortly after meeting with America's top diplomat. Here's CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin. Greeted by protesters demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, U.S. President Joe Biden would like nothing more, sending Antony Blinken to the Middle East in a diplomatic blitz, meeting with all sides, hoping to broker a peace deal and bring the hostages home. We do think it creates space for agreement to be reached, and we will work at that relentlessly until we get there. But Israel's prime minister forcefully rejected Hamas's three-phased proposal that would include a pause in the fighting, the release of hostages, women and children first, in exchange for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners, including militants responsible for the October 7th massacre and a complete withdrawal of Israeli troops. Benjamin Netanyahu dismissed the demands as delusional and Israel began bombing again, vowing victory in a matter of months, but hostage families say they can't wait that long. Very, very difficult for us to think about our son sitting there in the tunnels without food and water. Talks for a ceasefire more urgent than ever as Israel pushes into the southern city of Rafa, the last safe place left. This little boy, Mohammed, left shaking. We heard the strike, this man says, now planning to bury six people, including a little girl. Saudi Arabia now says it won't engage in diplomatic relations with Israel until the war ends and there's recognition of a Palestinian state. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. As Super Bowl fever hits Las Vegas, a stunt on one of its most famous attractions shut down traffic. Hey guys, I'm here on top of the sphere. A man who calls himself the pro-life Spider-Man scaled all the way to the top of the sphere and was arrested as soon as he came back down. Still ahead, a maple leaf and a fight over money. A taxing battle between John Tavares and the Canada Revenue Agency. Police have opened an investigation into a player in the Ontario Hockey League. Oshawa Generals forward Connor Lockhart has been suspended indefinitely by his team and the league after they learned of the investigation. The OHL says the 21-year-old was suspended for what it calls a league and team code of conduct matter. The captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs is in an off-ice battle against the Canada Revenue Agency. John Tavares is disputing an $8 million tax assessment connected to the first year of his contract. CTV's Sean Lifong explains. Signing with Toronto as a free agent back in 2018 made John Tavares a much richer man. Now the Leafs captain is in a fight with the Canada Revenue Agency over millions in bonus payment. According to an appeal filed recently in tax court, the CRA says Tavares owes over $6.8 million in unpaid taxes and $1.2 million in interest dating back to 2018. I think that the CRA takes a large-scale position and, and throws the book in a lot of uh, their assessments, and it's incumbent on taxpayers to file the disputes such as a notice of appeal in tax court. Jason Rosen is a tax lawyer who says that Tavares has a good chance of winning this appeal. In the appeal, it says Tavares was paid a salary of $650,000 U.S. in his first season in Toronto, but he received a bonus of $15.25 million the day he signed. 
part of a seven-year contract worth $77 million. Initially, over $2 million in taxes was paid at a rate of 15%. The appeal saying that at the time, Tavares was a resident of the United States as he played for over a decade in New York. The money went into his New York bank. The appeal pointed to Section 16, Subsection 4 of the Canada-U.S. Tax Treaty, which says that an amount paid by a resident of Canada to a resident of the United States as an inducement to sign an agreement relating to the performance of the services of an athlete may be taxed in Canada at a maximum of 15%. Court documents say the CRA then reassessed Tavares in the fall of 2022, ordering him to pay at a rate of 38% on the bonus plus interest. There was an option between 15% tax and playing for a team that offered that versus any Canadian team that's offering a 45% tax rate or higher. That uh, is a clear choice. We contacted KPMG, the firm representing Tavares in the case. They would not comment as the matter is before the courts. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News, Toronto. After the break. Look at this, guys. Wow. When going for a spin takes on a whole new meaning. There aren't many benefits to freezing rain, but in Saskatchewan, people seem to know how to make the best of it. One family is getting a lot of attention for lacing up and getting out. CTV's Allison Bamford on the smooth moves. Far from perfect driving conditions aren't keeping everyone off the roads. It's a perfect skating rink. Look at this, guys. Wow. We try to go to the local rinks as much as possible, but this was perfect because it was right in front of our house. It's absolutely incredible. A combination of freezing rain and a friendly neighborhood bet was too tempting for Shelley Bridgman to pass up. I text my neighbors and I said, do you think I could skate on this? And they were all like, no, no, it's way too thin. And then I said to my daughter, should we go try it out? The former figure skater did more than try. Holy cow! She mastered crossovers, spins, and the occasional fall. Whoa! Oh! Her only regret, she didn't wager any money. What surprised me is the thickness of the ice that she could actually do it without hurting herself or wrecking her skates. Skaters across the province took advantage of the icy conditions, a phenomenon that seems to happen at least once each winter, but never in this neighborhood. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I had a few people stop by walking and driving their trucks, just like, can't believe you're doing this, it's awesome. So it definitely caused some ruckus in the neighborhood. A lucky few to catch what could be Bridgman's first and only street skating performance. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. And that's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.